Hello there, and welcome to another episode of the Webinar Talk Show. My name is Tom Singer. And I'm Liz Green. And one of the things that we've noticed since COVID-19 happened is that our meeting professional partners are stressed about <laughs> just, just a tiny bit. Um, let's be serious. They were a stress group to start with. That's one of always one of the jobs that shows up very high on the job stress uh, list. But making the decision about are you going to have a live event in person? Are you going to have a hybrid event? Are you going to have a virtual event or are you going to cancel an event? is probably one of the most stressful things any meeting professional is going to have to do. Absolutely. And, and some people some people only had days to make that decision right. back in March right. and April. And we're going to continue to make those decisions probably for the next foreseeable future. And the message that Tom and I would like to share is please don't cancel your event. Your members, your employers, employees, your people need you. They need the content, they need the connection, they need you. But we understand that in this digital online environment, that just adds a little level of uncertainty, right? <laughs> this is new to lots of people. And we can't necessarily do the events live because of safety concerns, but right. people still need that sense of community and that, that touch base of education. People need to be growing. They do, because otherwise, you know, we start to feel just so alone and so disconnected. So if we're going to go down this road, we thought it was a good idea to bring on a couple of people who've been doing this work for a long time. People that we've worked with that have a vast knowledge about how to do hybrid and virtual events and on-demand learning that works. Mm -hmm. Tell them who we have, Tom. We are so fortunate because we have a couple of people from Digitel and Digitel is one of the leaders. They've been helping associations mm -hmm. and companies take their events online for virtual and hybrid for a really long time. And one of the people we have with us is Jim Parker. And you and I have worked with Jim on several yeah. events and he's really become a good friend and, and sort of a mentor about this whole world of going virtual because he's been doing it longer than God, longer than anybody I know. He is the CEO of Digital, And what he does is he works to make sure that his company, that they help their customers take their events online to deliver that education and the engagement that is so necessary. And we're also joined by Digital's VP of Sales and Marketing, Brian Zambali. He really works with those clients to leverage the content that they have in this virtual world world by listening to their needs and I think somehow just magically making them happen. So Brian and Jim, welcome to the webinar talk show. Welcome. Thanks for joining us, guys. Thank you. Thanks so much for having us. It is my understanding that uh, things have been a little busy for you since the <laughs> onset of COVID-19 and you've done a number of events, I think a very big number of events. Can you tell us what you're seeing and what's been successful as people have tried to make this transition. Yeah, it has been a crazy few months, Eliz and, and Tom. Thanks so much for having us. And, you know, Brian and I love to share our knowledge and we've been doing mm -hmm. this a long time. This isn't just a pivot for us in the last three months. I mean, we delivered our first virtual event in 2005. So this is something that we're very experienced in. And, you know, I, I have to say that as much as we're all in crisis, the good thing that's going to come out of all of this is that organizations are going to understand there is a whole world of people out there that are interested in what they're doing. And they're not just the people that want to go to Las Vegas, Orlando, Chicago, Washington, D.C. You know, 86% of people who have attended a hybrid event in the last 12 years have never been to a physical event. So as much as organizations are really looking at shifting to an online event, hybrid or virtual, because they feel that they can't run a physical event and they need to meet the audience that usually attends, they're going to find out that audience is significantly larger than the people that have been attending their event. 
And many of our clients are seeing record revenues being generated hmm. when they were completely in fear of running a virtual event. So as much as the doom and gloom of the world that we're in, people are going to realize that in the end, they're going to be engaging so many more professionals. And I know this is going to be tough to, to swallow. Virtual events can be and are more valuable than a face-to-face. -face. There oh. is so much more networking that can be done. Imagine asking people in chat, what are the resources that they use today to engage their audience, to deliver research, and all of the best practices, and you have 500 people typing in a chat in less than a minute, and mm. what a resource you can create in such a short period of time. <laughs> Whereas think about 100 people in a physical meeting, you give the microphone to Tom, Tom's gonna take 45 minutes telling him, <laughs> and all we learn is from Tom. So the reality is, is that if used correctly, we can absolutely drive greater value and people should not be reducing the price of their events because they think this is something less than a physical hmm. event. It's not. So there's a lot of worry though around people and I've seen it go both ways, to be honest with you, with my clients. I've seen people who usually have 3000 people at their event end up regardless of the price with 300 people and I've seen people who usually have a thousand have six thousand at their event right. when they go virtual. So what's the what's the secret sauce? I, I, from our perspective or my perspective, it's really around the audience and and the marketing and and the strategies. Um, you know, we think of when we're creating a virtual event, we're creating something we're going to engage and either sell or or for free. So some of the things you just mentioned. I would be curious to know on those clients were they paid events or free events because of course when when COVID hit lots of people went to a free model of their event just to get people into their event or conversion over from a physical to a virtual so i don't think our litmus test is large enough yet to really know how this will all work um, when we get talking about exhibitors and that and that whole engagement all of this is quite new just like jim said that 86 percent of attendees never were to your physical event but now we have those physical attendees now coming to the virtual with the expectations being a little bit different. So to me, it's, it's about how you structure, how you market, how you price. Uh, and just like Jim said, don't discount the price of your event because there's value there. And it just might take a little bit of time to get that value. Um, the first time someone does anything, we have to convince them to do it first. Right. But after that, that's where the fun is. So since we've started executing fully virtual events, almost unanimously, every single client we've serviced has come back with more events when we only started with one event with them. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that success in that chat. You know, more people can communicate together around listening to a talk than you ever could do in a physical room. I can't look over at Jim and talk to him without being rude to that audience right. or that speaker. This can create so much more engagement and conversation around, around the education. We just have to get people in there to start absorbing it. One of the things that Tom and I believe in very deeply is that live synchronous energy that happens as opposed to having something recorded. And, and I'm not saying you should never have something recorded, but those bridges in between that MC time, something has to be synchronous, live, because there's a different energy there, both for um, the people who are doing that, that speaking, but also for the people in the chat when they know it's in real time, that they can ask a question and have it asked to the person that's speaking. That's a different feeling. What are you finding in terms of what do your clients want and what do you steer them to in terms of recorded versus live synchronous? Well, he lives, we're swimming against the stream here in most yep. cases. So the industry is suggesting to pre-record mm -hmm. because of concerns that the speakers will have internet issues during their presentation. For us, we're all about live. I'm about energy. I'm about mm -hmm. passion. 
You know, when you see the sports teams playing now, it's just not the same without that live audience that's creating that buzz. We deliver 97% of our events live. And you know, one of the things that I'm not sure is, are all companies having success like we are? Or are we unique? And I know one of the things that's unique in what we do is delivering it live. Now, of course, there may be some small interruptions and there may be a couple of times when my voice goes a little haywire, but the energy and exactly what you're alluding to is the ability to have that conversation in real time excites people because they're part of something that's going on right now and it's cutting edge and I can listen to Eliz and listen to Brian and listen to Tom and it's not, oh, I'm watching a pre-record. Now I will yeah. say clients that have pre-recorded and have their speakers come in and do questions during the talk, we had some customers provide great feedback this past week about how exciting it was to have the speakers answer the questions while the talk was going on. Yep. But, but in we, the chat? Yep. Or yeah, we car. also bring the speakers in afterwards. But the reality is, is most of our events are running live and 95% mm -hmm. of them are running very, very effectively. And we're having phenomenal success. So I don't know if it's unique, but I will tell you, I would guarantee that I would suggest to a client, go live and deal with a little bit of technical issues. If you have a company that knows how to handle those technical issues, like we have what we call a, a, an extra producer so that if we had a thunderstorm in new england yesterday we just transfer the event to a guy in houston mm -hmm. and right. our producers are worldwide and we're having great success with the live delivery but like brian said we're in the infancy and there's a lot to learn but i I'm would really, say right now i would suggest live i'm really happy to hear you say that because mm -hmm. i have seen sort of a little bit of a trend to people wanting that recorded and the reason they're making that decision when I ask is for safety. That's it's right. not, I want a better experience for the audience. It's, I want the safety. And the reality is, and I've emceed a couple of events, as has Eliz, where mm -hmm. I'm prepared with plan B. If the speaker in right. Chicago has a thunderstorm and yep. he disappears for a minute, I turn on my camera and I come in and I start talking about what was in the chat room and, and other things until that speaker is able to come back and then we transfer back to them. And so I think having both the speaker live and having the MC transitions live yep. really make it more like a conference. And the example I used is we've all been to conferences where they've shown a video mm -hmm. versus a live speaker or even versus a live speaker coming in uh, digitally. We don't like the videos as much, do we? And think about the physical conference. How many times have we gone to a conference and watched something recorded? And we don't. How many times have all of us sat in a room when the mics went out because someone forgot to replace the batteries? Did it ruin the <laughs> session? Not at all. It built on the character of that session. So again, just to, to strengthen what Jim said, live, I mean, what we're doing now could never be done better unless it was being done live where we could interact with the audience and build my talk on the questions that are being asked at the same time I'm delivering my talk because I can change my talk. And if we, if we think a little bit farther ahead and Jim and I have had this dream for a long time, but the ability to communicate from the attendee to the speaker before they talk so that if Jim is giving a talk on virtual events and I can give him feedback on what I wanna learn about that virtual event leading up to that, he can pivot and change his entire talk based on his audience. And once we start going more and more virtual like this, powers and development and tools like that will allow Jim's talk to be more dynamic and more effective for his audience. Maybe his audience isn't beginners, maybe they're advanced. Right. So that communication can't be done on a pre record. That's absolutely true. And once you've sent that pre record in, it's it's locked and right now things are changing so quickly. Your, your talk could, could be out of date in a week, <laughs> in depending a week, on yeah. what you talk about. Uh, one of the things that Tom and I 
really learned in our three months of emceeing breakouts for the National Speakers Association is that content delivery in the virtual or hybrid space is different than what you might do in a ballroom. Uh, we definitely coached our presenters to, you know, like, no, I'm sorry, we have 60 minutes, but your content delivery is going to be 25 minutes. And then we're going to have a conversation after that to actually delve into that in a way that's more interactive. Because I think everybody is tired of listening to people drone on in, <laughs> in the, the virtual The talking head over PowerPoint is not what people are excited about. No. No, but it is a catalyst. Mm -hmm. It's a catalyst to create conversation. Mm -hmm. And then, and, and that's the key. So, you know, we recommend to our clients that we have an engagement officer in it, and we encourage them to be that engagement officer and to come in and hi, I'm Jim Parker, executive director. We're thrilled that you're here. Where is everybody from? You know, you only have to yes. spend a couple of slow pitch lob balls in front of people and they start just talking and engaging and and, oh, I used to work at Johns Hopkins. Do you know Dr. So-and-so? And next mm -hmm. thing you know, I mean, do you guys remember the year that you you narrated and, and emceed NSA? We had yeah. an entire community of people build a Facebook page around that. That are still connected exactly. to each other. Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, and I hate to say it, I've been doing conferences for 35 years, and everyone says they go to a conference to network. And mm -hmm. I would challenge to say, how many conferences have you gone and you went home and in the next 30 days, you had a conversation with one of the other people that were at that conference? And I would be willing to bet a hundred bucks. Not many people do. You get home, you get busy. Virtually, you have their access. You have mm -hmm. their information. Wow, I was fascinated with what Eliz said. I'm going to reach out to her. Rather than going into your wallet and pulling out 15 business cards and go, <laughs> did I meet this guy at a session or at the bar? So <laughs> That you pull out like four weeks later and like, I don't even know who these exactly. people are. Yeah. So I, how often do you forget more, who the people are? Yeah, there's so much more connectivity and, and resources that are built around an event. You know, we're really fascinating. I was like all about on demand for the first 30 years of my business. Mm -hmm. And when we started live streaming in 2008, I realized in two hours, people want to learn with others. Yes. They want to be part of an event. And on demand is okay for the 9% of people that need their CMEs or their CPEs <laughs> or whatever quickly. But when you want to learn with others and learn what are, what is Tom's questions and Brian's questions and Eli's questions, because they have their mind of their own, that creates so much more dynamic engagement mm -hmm. than watching something by yourself. Yes. So, and to add to that, Jim, how many of us who go to conferences are outgoing? I would say that a mm -hmm. lot of people who say, I want to go to a conference to network, that person isn't, a, a, that person is an outgoing person. But how many of the, how much of the world is not that way? And if you have an organization that reaches 20% of their membership on, on site, that still leaves 80% of other people who may not want to engage face-to-face. -face. And that chat gives them a voice without that fear. And, and we start interacting with other kinds of people around the event that have been waiting for this type of interaction to have yeah. a voice, but not to be afraid to raise my hand and stand in front of a microphone. So Brian and Jim, you guys have seen a lot the last four months. So, I believe, because both Eliz and I together and separately have emceed many, many events, both in person on stage and virtually. Mm -hmm. I think having that host, that MC, that person who can come and do Q&A from the audience and from their own brain with the speaker following their presentation, I think it's more important in a virtual or hybrid event than it even is in a large event on stage. Are you seeing most people really utilize that role of a host? I would say not. Mixed. Yeah, I would say it's mixed. Um, I get a lot of questions on, should I have that MC? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think if we think of a virtual event and simplify it, I know everyone's afraid of doing their first one. Oh, but yeah. if we think of all the things we've learned in the physical space, 
most of that stuff can be applied. So in your question, how many times in the general session we have MCs? Most of the time we have warm ups, we have acts that warm the crowds up. But in the breakouts, we don't have that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Because those are the speakers who introduce themselves with a chairperson next to them. And those sessions have just as much value as that general session, but a different type of value. So what I would recommend is if you have that voice, because, because Tom, it's hard to get that voice. I have a very close client I've been with for a long time. And she was emceeing and moderating her sessions. And she was going on vacation and she had to train someone to do it. And her fear was, is you have to be able to think on your feet to moderate successfully. It's yeah. probably why we don't have moderators and those people and all those breakups. So I would say for your general sessions, highly produce those. Have opening videos, like in this show, we had the opening uh, audio and, and slide. Mm -hmm. Do that higher production, bring that value in, but then there's still so much value in those breakouts. And then we don't have to have more moderators and more MCs. So then you're looking at, how do I get five MCs that can do this job that we know one person of our organization can? Yeah, and I would agree. I mean, you know, Tom, again, I, you know, I just said it prior to your question, it's like the engagement officer. You know, I mean, I've seen you talk at, at a physical event and you talk about icebreaker and how you need to create the environment for dialogue and conversation that doesn't just happen on its own. And I think nope. that's where many events that I'm hearing from clients, it wasn't like your event. It's because you just leave a chat box that's closed and people have to find it and they have no one to tell them, give us your views, tell us. I mean, I think the value of an MC is, is exponential. And I gotta tell you, our clients are making more money than they've ever made. And I see that money going to more and more. Brian has a client who is now hiring magicians and entertainment. Mm -hmm. And we have a client running cooking shows and how to cook healthy in between sessions. And the reviews that we get back are just, we want more, we want more, we want more. So it's about creativity. I mean, Tom, if you ask me and Eliz, what's the most exciting thing you've seen in the last four months? It's the creativity where clients are not saying, oh, we can't do that. They have to do it. And I mean, how many people are doing things in four months like us? When we started in March, I was on camera and all of the clients were off camera. Now everyone's on camera and their lighting's great. Their quality's great. And I got to tell you, I love seeing your wall and Eliz's environment and I think people's expectations have completely changed to, you know what, we're in a new world and I'm okay with it. I'm going to participate because if I don't, it's exactly as you said in your opening, people are feeling isolated and alone and organizations need to reach out to people more importantly today than ever before. I couldn't agree more. Now there is one connection that we haven't talked about yet, that engaging your participants with your vendors, that, that trade show floor, however that works. And that has been a big stressor for our meeting professional partners. Uh, like, how are you going to do that? Because you need sponsors to make your thing grow, but how are you going to make that happen. What are you seeing? I know Brian and I were talking before we went live about some of the success you're having in that. Well, it's a challenge. Brian, I'll take this quick and then pass it to sure. you, but it, it's a challenge. I mean, there's no question that even physical meetings have been challenged for years mm -hmm. on how to provide ROI to the exhibitors. And I exhibited a dozen meetings a year and at least six of them, I shake my head because I only met the <laughs> exhibitor next to me. So yeah. there's no kidding that this is a challenge. But what we're really focusing on is providing those exhibitors with the ability to present their own content. We have full integrations with Zoom in our platform so that all of our sponsors and exhibitors can create their own showcase and sort mm. of duplicate that 40 by 40 booth who has 20 chairs 
And when the sessions end, everyone walks to the exhibit hall, sits in those chairs, and one of the company representatives get up and say, we're going to wait a minute to see who else joins us. And then I look forward to telling you all about Digitel. So we're duplicating face-to-face -face because face-to-face -face does create trust and connectivity. So we try to build face-to-face -face in as much as possible. But I'll let Brian tell you about some of the things the clients are doing with giveaways and that because creativity is running rampant right now. That's good. Yeah. And once we started, and Eliz, you and I were talking about this, but once that I didn't have the Wi-Fi to sponsor, I don't have the lanyards, I'm forced as an exhibit manager to come up with different things, different sponsorships. Jim and I have been trying forever to, to try to reach that topic and say there's all this other value here, but now they have to do it. And, and I'll go mm -hmm. back again and say that we need to think about the physical things we've always done. Maybe things that don't work anymore will work in the virtual. So let's yeah. first off, the old exhibit hall Easter egg hunt. You know, having a platform that, that can do the engagement between the attendees and the education and the attendees and the exhibitors and the attendees and the attendees all in the same place and interweave together, which is why I think we're lending to having so much success. You know, gamification and, and badges lead to you visiting these booths. And then when you visit these booths, then you go to a Zoom showcase and you get to experience it and, and see Jim's pitch. And those types of things, you have to build breaks in your programs. And one of the things mm -hmm. that I struggle with is many clients come and say, I, we can't have breaks. The industry says, if you have a break, everybody's gone. <laughs> well, if you don't give them a break, they're going to take a break. Everybody needs yes. a break. I need a break to go to the bathroom. I need a break to eat. I need a break to, to have a break, right? Right. You've got to use those breaks. Those breaks should be, should be those fun acts. So magicians, and, and I'm, I'm quickly growing a list of things that people can engage between their education. Magicians, um, comedians, bands, all kinds of things that can engage and give a break. But then also the exhibitors break time. So a successful event is about the agenda, right? And those little agendas that we have, the pocket guides on site, they do the same thing I'm describing. We have yeah. some advertisements, some paid advertisements. I have clients doing all kinds of ads in their event page. So we have ads in there. Then we have concurrent breakouts. Well, I'm sorry, we start with a general session and we have some concurrent breakouts. Then we go to some exhibit hall hours. Then we go to some concurrent breakouts. Then we go to some fun activities at night with Zoom. And that is a successful agenda that will keep your audience there multiple days all day. And driving the traffic through a single agenda has been, I think, one of the most successful things of getting people to the exhibit hall. Mm. Notifications, exhibitors are all now live. You know, we have a live flag next to our exhibitors to tell attendees someone's in this exhibit hall on live. If you can't direct them there, you can't just build it and think they'll come. <laughs> we need to do the things in the emails, exhibit hall hours. We need to do notifications, exhibit hall hours. They should be posted all over the place, just like they are when you get the physical. Man, right. signs walking up to registration, what do I see first? The exhibit hall hours. So it's driving the traffic. And then thinking even further, I have a client pulling Grubhub gift cards and then Grubhub mm -hmm. is sponsoring them for free and they're sending it to them and everybody's eating together from with their favorite restaurant around with a sponsor's cool. name on it. Those things are possible. Um, and, and, and really it's, it's the creativity. So the things I'm mentioning aren't really my ideas. They're ideas that clients are putting through our platform that I just have the luxury of being a part of and gives us six more minutes, six more months. And I tell every client this, talk to me every two months because every two months I'm gonna have a whole nother depth of what you can do in your event. Six months from now, when we start 2021, we're going to have so much more value of how we can educate, but then also entertain because a mm -hmm. conference isn't just education. It's entertainment, it's networking, and it's all being done in one facility. So if you think of your virtual event, you're not making everybody walk from building to building to go here and engage and go here to get my, my food. They're all in one place. That's the success that I feel like we're having is because it's all in one place. And we worked so hard to get there to have all these different types of tools that really only 5% of our clients used, but now 100% will use to have success. 
So Perfect. as we wrap up this interview, I think there's one area we have to touch on that we probably all agree is the future. And that mm -hmm. is hybrid events. Right mm -hmm. now, so much of what we're doing is virtual, but eventually the safety reasons will come down and we'll be able to actually go back to live events in mass and hug. And I think there's a place for that. People are going to want that human engagement, yes. but some people are gonna want to be able to do this, to be at home and to, to log on. So where six years ago, Eliz and I thought everyone is gonna wanna have hybrid events and we're gonna be yes. able to serve as those MCs. We were a little bit ahead of the game because people didn't care about that at home audience all that much. If they were live streaming, it was just a broadcast of the main stage with no special programming for the people at home. With a little slide that says, we'll be back in 30 minutes. <laughs> So what do you think the future holds when it comes to hybrid? Well, Jim has been saying it, 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 this, um, this analogy with the NFL forever. And I've been listening to it and I've been saying it, but the NFL who was approached by the cable companies to broadcast their games on national television. And sorry, Jim, I want to take this one from you. And, <laughs> and unanimously, all the NFL said, you know, no way. We need to fill our seats. But eventually that online, that, that audience watching games has grown larger than that audience and has more value revenue wise than that physical seating and watching that football mm -hmm. game. This will push that agenda that Jim and I thought would be years until it was there. I think your virtual value and your virtual audience, especially in 2021, is going to be larger than your physical. And once that happens, then just like Jim said, then there's revenue to build that audience. Mm -hmm. and, and, and again, if we look at those numbers, 80% of your membership, who is a part of your membership because they, they value something you're giving them. It's not the annual meeting, but it's the education. That audience mm -hmm. is going to be larger than that physical audience will ever be. And I think this is what's going to be the trend of moving forward. And Tom, I would say, you know, we've been delivering hybrid events for 12 years. And I think that organizations should look at a model where they deliver one or two of their rooms via live streaming, and then they record all of their other content, and they must create a product that equals the value of what it costs to attend the physical. Do not discount that. If it's $1,200 to come to your physical, you need to build $1,200 of value online. Oh. And we have been delivering that for 12 years. Every client is growing and growing and growing. And never once have we had anything from a customer or a client say, I paid $1,200 and didn't feel I got the value. If your organization delivers 100 sessions in four days, live stream 20 of them, record the other 80, and build a product of $1,200 in value. Don't say, and I can't tell you how many boards I'm hearing, oh, well, let's just charge $399. No, no, charge $1,200 and give the online audience an equal or more value. Maybe you record 20 more special sessions and add them to the virtual. Yeah. But the reality is, is deliver the value equal to what you're charging and you will find an audience that grows year after year after year. And one of the things that Eliz and I do when we host these hybrid events is we actually, during those coffee breaks, lunch hours, happy hours, we actually interview the speakers. We interview the attendees and the executives or the board of the organization and the people live don't ever get to see that. That's nope. extra content just yep. for the at-home audience. And the feedback is, wow, that interview after the keynote where you asked in-depth questions was better Often than- Often from the, from the virtual audience because we can see it coming in. Exactly. And, exactly. and we can show and that's that. getting them involved. And we can show that with the clients that listen to our idea. I've been saying, Jim's been saying, that you need to build this online audience. You need to start now piggybacking off the NFL acronym uh, or analogy. You need to build the audience. Those clients that listened, that built that audience, when COVID hit, they pivoted and they had more success than they had with a yep. hybrid and, and on-site before because the audience was there and the audience understood how to use the technology and, and to benefit from it. So if that client had discounted back then, then when we had, they had a pivot, 
then they have no choice but to keep it at the same price. You can't really go up on your price and your value of what you're meeting is physically is the value of what it is virtually. It should just be that simple. And this is a long-term play then is what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, and, and, and let me say to all, I mean, Liz, one of the things that's crazy is, is, you know, clients are generating a million dollars in revenue and they're not paying the facility, the AV company, they're paying right. Digitel or another vendor 50 to 75,000 to deliver the event. There's so much profit that should be allocated to an MC to allocate and create even more engagement Yep. And and then you build an audience and you, it, it's, right. it's really pretty simple, but the gut reaction is, oh my gosh, we can't do this. And I would say COVID has blown all of those, we can't do's out of the water. And now it's, we must do. And when they do it, we're seeing huge success all around the board. It's really exciting to me. It, it really is. Well, if somebody is out there thinking to themselves, okay, so maybe I don't want to cancel my conference, <laughs> how do they get a hold of you? Well, that's the <laughs> challenge right now. So um, <laughs> we are not accepting new clients at the moment because mm. our existing clients are actually, like Brian said, you know, we would typically service them for one or two meetings a year. And now we're servicing them for 20 to 75 meetings a year. But we are scaling our company. We're hiring. We've hired 100 people in the last 60 days. And we are preparing to open our doors for 2021. And we would love to service organizations and help them engage their members. Um, but I mean, right now, we're a little challenged. That's why when you guys asked me to talk, I went, oh, no, what are we going to do? But <laughs> um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm here to help organizations succeed, whether they use us or not. And the truth is they can reach out to us. We can help them with best practices, but they need to be a believer and then they need to jump in and learn. And your first event may not be what you hoped, but your second, third, and fourth will be some of the most exciting things. And I think our clients are coming back and going, whew, we got our first virtual event under our belt and I can't believe how much our team has learned. And the next one is better. So we look forward to talking to your audience in 2021 um, and we should be ready to open our doors up uh, in January. And your website is? Uh, Digital Inc, D-I-G-I-T-E-L-L-I-N-C.com. And of course you can go on to any of the industry chats and that and people are talking about Digital all throughout. So it should be pretty easy to find us. Fantastic. Well, thank you both for joining us. That thank was a great so conversation. I actually am very excited about 2021 and going forward and what's possible. And it just let's not live in what's not working. Let's live in what the future holds. Exactly. exactly. Well, thank you again for, for being with us. And thank you to everybody who tuned in. Eliz, the, the webinar talk show, we keep getting more interesting and intriguing guests and we have a lot of new stuff coming up every Monday and Wednesday at 11 o'clock central. We're right here with in-depth interviews because Eliz and I believe that the interview is the part that's missing in this digital world, but we all grew up watching Oprah and Larry King and the Today Show and The View. This is a part where you can bring really compelling, important data and information to people like we just did with, with Jim mm -hmm. and Brian through this format of interviews. Absolutely. You can find us at webinartalkshow.com. And of course, we'd love it if you'd like us on Facebook at Webinar Talk Show. We'll see you next week with more great guests. Brian and Jim, thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, guys. Keep doing great work.